once again, or good afternoon or good evening. Uh, if you're watching this later on, it's so good to see everyone. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone. If this is your first time with us, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here today. If you're online as well, we want to welcome you. Just want to let you know, everybody, how much God loves you. And this is what it's all about. It's not about church. It's not about filling a building up. What it's about is filling ourselves up more with God. And God has good plans for us. And I want to encourage us with that today. A couple of quick announcements before we get into a lot that we need to share today is uh, this is what's going on. We have a food drive coming up, and we want to encourage you to participate. You know, believe it or not, a lot of folks are still struggling, and we want to be able to be a tangible witness and a help to many people. And so you can see those things as you walk out of today. You can hand, uh, hand in one of those bags and participate with that. We're getting a big freezer here to fill it with meat and all that the week of the distribution. The second thing is, next week is my birthday. I'm going to ask you a favor. All right? I'm going to be 23 years old. Why are you laughing? Uh, and, and next week, we're going to have baptisms here. So I'm excited about it. We're going to be baptizing people. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to do it. If you were baptized as a baby, as I was, that's great. But, you know, there's nothing like having believer's baptism, what Christ did, and what it's like. If you give your life to Jesus, it's like going to the justice of the peace. You, you, you know, you're still married to Christ. But when you have a baptism, it's like going public with your faith. You're declaring before people, and you're declaring before the heavenlies that I am Christ, and he is mine powerful. We've seen God do great things in people's lives. We want to encourage you to do that. You can sign up for it. All you have to do is show up a little early for next week, and we'll be good to go. Hey, let's get right into our sermon series today, Unshakable. We're going through First Peter, line by line, verse by verse, and today we're going to deal with something that's kind of, um, kind of in, 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 no big deal. We're going to deal with slavery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to deal with slavery. I, I love how First Peter brings this stuff up. So it has a lot to do with our culture right now because we are, we are feeling the reverberations and the pain and the difficulty of our country and of Western civilization. It's come to a head now. A lot of the pain that our society is experiencing is because of the things of the past. And a lot of us are saying, hey, we need to move on from that. That's not what this is about. This is not political. This is biblical. But you're going to see some things in here that you can employ and I can employ that make a difference. And often, okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to tackle the, sh the uh, slavery issue in the Bible, and then we're going to get into this. Submitting to a boss who's a jerk. <laughs> I put that in quotes because your boss is not a jerk. You may think he is or she is. How do you deal with a difficult boss? How do you deal with somebody that is very, un very difficult to deal with? Well, <laughs> there's an extreme example that Peter gives us here. He talks about submitting to, uh, slaves to their masters, we're going to get into in a few moments. So I want you to listen to this verse, and I'll try, I'm going to ask you not to go erupt in like, oh my gosh, this is incredibly horrible. How can we trust the Bible? Well, hang on, okay? We're going to read this together here. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, and reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of injustice, suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it, to your credit, if you receive a beating? What? What? A beating for doing wrong and endure it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it is commendable before God. Okay, wow, what is going on here? I'm going to tell you something right now. This passage of Scripture was used by slave owners in America and Europe during the slave trade, the African slave trade that is horrific that took place. They would quote these verses and tell them to submit. you got to do it. Hey, the Bible says it. So a lot of modern readers would go, wait a minute here. The Bible got this wrong. If the Bible got this wrong, how can we trust it with sexuality issues? How can we trust it with political issues? How can we trust it with relationship issues? It's so out of date. I guess what we need to do is take the good and throw out the bad. In other words, let's pick and choose what we think is appropriate in our culture today. Obviously, the Bible's out to lunch on this thing. So we can't trust the Bible, right? I mean, that's, come on, let's be honest. If you read this, you're like, yeah. I, so we can't, no, I, I want to hold on here. How do we trust the Bible in this? How do we deal with it? Well, first of all, I, I, I want to let you know a few things. I want us to bring us back to where we're at. 
I want us to bring us back to what we talked about. We're going to talk about this and how can we trust the Bible when it gets, when it gets slavery so wrong. But before we do that, I want to bring us the context of what we've been talking about, okay? The Bible does something extraordinary. The Bible and God always goes for the heart first. If you get someone's heart, the behavior will change. And so this is what we need to do. We need to go after the heart, and that's what the Bible does. That's what God does. We're going to get into it in a few moments, but let's go ahead and, and go ahead and review a little bit. That's what we've been saying. Your actions spring up from what you believe about your identity. So really important about 1 Peter. How do you deal with suffering? This is about 50 AD. Persecution's happening in the church. How do you deal with persecution? You need to know whose you are, and you need to know who you are. Your identity determines your destiny. Your identity determines your behavior. And that's why there's such an attack upon our identities since we've been growing up. People all their lives are trying to be validated and trying to feel like they're worth something. We all struggle with identity issues. But the truth of the matter is, when you know who you are in God, you can walk with great, great confidence. And here it is, one of the theme verses of 1 Peter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim. So clearly, the Bible is saying here, you matter to God. We, those Christ believers, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago, look yourself in the mirror and read this out to yourself because that's who you are if you're in Christ. For his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you know your identity, that you're God's people, once you know your identity, then your behavior and your life should reflect that identity. And so what 1 Peter does, it talks about how we intersect and how do we deal with society. Here he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against you. So before we try to correct culture, before we try to correct our spouse or our parents or anyone, we got to deal with the stuff inside of us first. We have to go with the war with the stuff inside of us. You're your own worst enemy. You are. And you're your best friend. You've got to deal with your own stuff first. You're very clear about that. He goes on. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles. Those are unbelievers of the day. Honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, fight against yourself and it's always right to do the right thing. Always have honor. Always take care of it. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Why? We don't do it for our sake. We do it for the Lord's sake. We behave. We do the right thing for God's sake. Not for ourselves. Not for our comfort. But for the Lord's sake. Whether to the king of supreme or governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil dealers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. It's the will of God we submit to government. That was last week. That by doing so, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants, love slaves of God. And a, bond, a love slave would be somebody who voluntarily says, I will be your slave. And that's what it says of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and make fun of the president. Doesn't it say that? Honor the king. Okay, I, I saw this past week. A pastor uh, online, on, sometimes Facebook is not a good place to be, but I saw it on Facebook where he was literally showing Joe, uh, President Biden falling down the stairs and making a meme out of it and showing a video and laughing about it. I'm like, what? I was horrified. What a bad witness. He's breaking this. He's not honoring his leader, making fun of our president. What, are you kidding me? When you make fun of your president, you know what you're doing? You're hurting yourself. He's our covering. Whether you voted for him or not, we got to pray for our president. we got to pray for leaders over us. And so we should honor the king. If we don't do that, we're not honoring God. So we mentioned last week we're to submit to authority as unto the Lord, right? We also are to submit to authorities unless they command you to sin. If they ask you to do something, we must obey God rather than man. Go to next week, last week, and catch up. We must always show honor and respect as witnesses of God. So let me just kind of stop you for a moment and bring a little context. Slaves, obey your masters. What is the story with that? How are we supposed to obey our masters? Well, let me give you some background. This is not the slave trade in the United States of America. This is different. In the time of Peter when he wrote this, it would be similar today to living in North Korea. 
In North Korea, the dictator, Kim, he is God. When you're a child, you sing songs to him. He's got posters up everywhere. The government is like the kingdom of God, and he is the, he's God. For lack of a better term, that's what it is. You worship the emperor. They're atheists. They don't believe in God. You worship the state. The state is your answer for everything. That's what they do. If you're in a system like that, how do you change the system? They did not live in a representative form of government like we have today. They don't live in a democracy. Neither did they in the time of Peter and Paul and the prime of Christ. They were under subjection to the government. They had no rights, especially as Jewish people. You were the lowest rung. You were maybe a, a rung higher than the, than the slaves. You had no rights. So you really could not do what we do today. You couldn't gather. You couldn't have protests and all that kind of thing. So when you read this, you're like, what? Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Why was Peter not against slavery? Why was there not an outcry? Why didn't he be like Spartacus and have a rebellion against the Roman government? And believe me, the early church wanted to do that. And this is why Jesus was probably, probably uh, why Judas betrayed Christ. Because Jesus was not doing what he wanted him to do. We want Jesus to kind of have a political uprising. And let's take care of the politics. Let's get it right. And unfortunately, what has happened to the church today, we think that's the answer to everything. It's not. It always starts here. But we don't they didn't live in a representative form of government. So we have a responsibility to be good citizens, everybody. We have a responsibility to vote. We have a responsibility to run for school boards and governors and what have you. Mayors, go ahead. Get involved and use your rights as an American citizen. We should do that. That's what we're called to do. We had these rights. They didn't have those rights in those days. So the context is a little bit different. Okay? Now, let's look at this. In 1 Timothy 1.10, the Bible says this. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or slave trade. Oh, my gosh, you're doing a slavery and homosexuality. Pastor, why do you go? I'm not going there. The, uh, Peter is. Ban him. Don't ban me. I'm, I'm just a messenger here, okay? He says the law is for people who are sexually immoral. So in other words, if you live above the law, if you live above the law, you don't have to worry about the law. If, if my kids go to bed at the time I tell them to go to bed and they make their bed and they do everything they're supposed to do, then guess what? They had no more curfew anymore because I'm going to trust them. They know better. But if you don't obey, then you have the law. So look what the Bible says. So what does the Bible say about slavery? Here it goes. The law is for people who are, sex, who are sexually immoral, who practice homosexuality or slave traders this what was going on in european countries in america the african slave trade what they would do is slave trade they would trade slaves they would sell them auction blocks they would bring them over here in inhumane situations and my friends it is a pain and the reverberations are still felt today if you don't think so you're saying get over it then you don't really understand what's going on you have to understand that there was a lot of injustice back then yeah but that's not me i'm not going to get into that we're not going to get into that, but you have to, you cannot deny the fact that there are reverberations and consequences for our actions as a society, as a Western civilization. That we did some great things, but there are reverberations and trouble from that. You have to understand, it wasn't that long ago. So now you're ready to shut me off. He's getting political. I'm not getting political. Can we just stop? I, I, just, I sense it right now. People are getting upset with me. Would you please stop? Can we stop trying to put people in silos and demonize them? Can we just listen and, and, and be quiet? Can we seek to understand instead of being understood? Go a long way, everybody. Please, I'm not getting political. I'm saying some buzzwords. Oh, he's that way. And you want to categorize? Please, we're not going to do that. He's going he's to, this is a liberal church. I know. No, stop. I hear you right now. I do. I hear it in my head. Maybe it's my own <laughs> guilt. Can we stop? Can we please just listen? Can we do that? Seriously. Someone's going off. Let's go against. Listen. Ask questions. Empathize. Even if you disagree with them. Listen, most people want to live good lives. They're just choosing the wrong way to do it. Now back to our regular scheduled program. So he's saying it's for these types of things. So he was against it. Here's some facts about the first century slavery, slave market, okay? Number one, 50 to 60% of the people in that society back in those days were slaves. 
It was not just in one ethnic group. It was everybody and all sorts of people. Think about that. The uh, African slave trade in America was about 10%, and it was one race of people primarily. But back in those days, 50 to 60% in all different races were involved there. It was not primarily racial, but it was the economic system. And this is what they fought in, war and, in the Civil War in America. And incidentally, as a little side footnote, Abraham Lincoln was a born-again Christian. William Wilberforce, his work in England found its way across the sea to here. Abolitionists, many of them, actually the, the foundation of abolition movement came from born-again Christians. Okay, just throw, throw it in there for free. Okay? It was also typically not lifelong in the time of the first century. It might be for 10 years. Very rarely did you see a slave over the age of 30. Okay, generally speaking, of course, okay? So it was not typical lifelong. Also, the reasons for slavery were varied. Sometimes you could be like Joseph, for example, in the Old Testament, the book of Joseph, book of Joseph, book of Genesis, there's no such thing as the book of Joseph, so don't think I'm a heretic. He's political, and he's making up books of the Bible. <laughs> no, no, no. So Joseph was a slave, but he took care of Potiphar's house, Right? And so you'd have slaves in high positions. It was kind of like a way, it was, and, and that's how it was in those days. I don't have time to break it all down, but it wasn't all whips on the backs, okay? There was some high fluting uh, slavery back in those days, different. There were normal working conditions in many cases, and also many war, war criminals were put into slavery. You take over society, they become slaves. If you committed a crime, you could become a slave to the one you committed a crime to. So if you steal someone's house or burn their house down, then you could hire somebody until they pay off their debt. That's what would happen. Okay, slavery was also uh, brutal because bad masters. Primarily the system was working sort of in that, when that it was not working well. I don't, I don't condone it. I don't, I mean, I do condone it. Excuse me, I'm really doing good today. I do condone it. I do not condone it, whatever I said. Okay, everybody, I need another cup of coffee. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm trying to like, tiptoe through the tulips here, and it's a little difficult. But what I'm trying to say is, it was not, I'm not saying that this is correct, but this was the system back in those days, okay? And, 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 and in fact, if you could not pay your debts, you'd be sold into slavery. Like, if you go to a restaurant today, you go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and you can't pay your bill, guess what you'll be doing for the next three weeks? You'll be washing dishes, right? So back in those days, if you couldn't pay your bills, then your whole family could be sold to slavery until you pay your debt. Now, what's so interesting is this. There's no talk of Jesus or the first century church of reforming the culture, but instead leading people to Christ. Christianity is not a political movement. It's a spiritual movement of a changed heart. What has happened and both, on all the sides of the issue, it's become political. And when politics and Jesus get in bed, they're disgusting offspring. And we've seen it in our culture. It's not about that. What it's about, my friends, Jesus went after the heart. You change the heart, you change the behavior. Let me show you a few things about that, okay? Peter and Paul instruct us how we are to deal with slavery. For example, in 1 Corinthians, he talks about slavery. He says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although you, you can, again, if you can gain your freedom, do so. So what he's saying is, say, listen, if you're a slave and you can get free, great. But he's not telling them to rebel. All right? Also, in 1 Corinthians, we go on. For the one who is a slave, when called to faith in the Lord, is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave, you were brought with a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. So, here's the truth. God always deals with the heart. Listen, if you want to change somebody, and this is the important thing I'm learning in parenting. My wife and I always ask ourselves the question, do we have our kids' hearts? We can put all the restrictions on them and watch their phones and put GPS chips in them and you know, put electric impulses upon their necks and all that. We can do all that. We don't, I'm joking, everybody. But the moment you take it away, they go crazy, right? I want to make sure I have their hearts. The discipline's important. But God's amazing uh, equality for everyone is found right here, everybody, in Galatians 3.28. It says this. There is neither Jew or Greek. 
Okay, that's a big deal back then. The Jews had to stay separate from the rest of the people. Unclean, they're dirty. Don't even eat in the same plate. Okay, there's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave or free. There's neither male or female. All oh, great. This is no, no, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about value to God and the equality of salvation to everyone. There's neither male or female, for you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. That's, that's incredible. The promises of Abraham are available to us today because of what Christ did. All the promises are available to us today. You see, Christians were accused in the early days of trying to subvert the whole economic system since they humanized and brought equal value to all people, including slaves. It caused a great deal of problem. When you're teaching someone that we're all the same in Jesus Christ, there's no difference between slave and free, that bucks the entire system. But what it's doing is the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying it's about the heart. Get the heart, change the culture. Laws are fine. Laws are important. I'm not saying you're not supposed to have laws. But the best thing you can do is change the law of the heart. And that's the big deal. In Philemon, the apostle Paul writes to a slave owner because one of his slaves ran away. And this is what he says. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. The apostle Paul's writing to a Philemon who owns a slave. I wanted you to help you because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus, this is a slave, okay, for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He's no longer like a slave. That's what he says. He's no longer like a slave. Look what he's saying here to you. He's more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother. What is Paul doing? Paul is breaking down the entire system. He's breaking down the prejudice of the heart. He's breaking down the spiritual strongholds by bringing the love of Christ in the middle of it. The way we change our culture, primarily, first step is change your own heart and pray for others' hearts. Yes, it's important to vote correctly. It's important to have your voices raised. Yes, but that doesn't change things. Look what Martin Luther King Jr. did. Peaceful protest. Look what he did. Look at the power that he had. And he was also a believer. He's no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave. For he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now, he will mean much more to you, both as a man and a brother in Christ. The slave became a believer in Jesus. He's now a brother in Christ. So, if you consider me your partner, welcome him. This is radical. This is like scandalous. This is like throwing a stick of dynamite on the entire socioeconomic system and prejudice of that day. He's saying, treat him like you treat me. In other words, he's saying, he's equal. So there's no such thing as upper class, lower class. There's no caste system in the kingdom of heaven. The only thing, that, and here's the good news, we're all sinners saved by God. There's not one that's greater than anybody else compared to God. So, now, now that we've established the fact that slavery was not God's idea, and God dealt the better way by going after a heart, we're going to spend the next little bit of time submitting to a boss who's a jerk. <laughs> okay? I put it in quotes. So don't get upset with me for calling someone a jerk. Okay. And First Peter, I want now the context. If you can do it with slave owners, how about this? Okay? You who are slaves must submit to your master with all respect. Submission means going under with respect. Okay? Do what they tell you. Not only if they are kind and reasonable. Well, I don't like that boss. I'm not going to work hard because he's a jerk or she's a jerk. No. You're supposed to work and do your work unto who? The Lord. But even if they are cruel. This place is so toxic. I can't work here anymore. You know, everyone talks in the back room. Hey, 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 boss. How you doing? Doing great, great. And as soon as you leave the room, I can't stand Eric. He's a jerk too. I come back in the room. Someone else comes in the room. Eric, is this person a jerk? Uh, and that's a horrible place. And just complain and complain and complain. It's horrible. So what does submit? So it means place yourself under the authority of another. Submission is not just doing the work, but having the right attitude. I'm not yelling at you. Right? I'm not yelling at you. No, but there's a lot of staccato in your voice and your facial expressions is yelling at me. 
So, you know, I'll do what you say. How you doing? Working on it. And you come in, you have a sour attitude, you're upset. What good does that do? It just ruins the entire work environment. That God's not pleased with that, everybody. But you do your best unto the Lord. We're not in slavery, right? Submit. Place yourself under the authority of another. Submission is not just doing the work, but having the right attitude. And your boss's behavior is not the standard of submission. If your boss acts good, then you submit. If your boss does not act good, then you don't submit. It's not fair. He's asking me, he just changed the project. It's due on Monday. It's Friday. I'm going to have no weekend. He used to drive me crazy in seminary. Dr. Story, God bless him. He's still alive. He would have a Greek test on Monday. So that means on Sunday, the Lord's Day, I'd be studying all day. Okay, okay. We all complain about it, by the way. Your boss's behavior is not the standard of submission. All right? It's not. Here we go. So we, li we don't live in a slave culture. Submit or quit. If you cannot submit to your boss, do the boss a favor. Get out of there. But chances are God wants you to learn to submit. God wants to work on your character more than your comfort. God wants to work on my character and your character more than your comfort. And if you keep running from job to job to job, that's not good either, everybody. You know, bear under it. If it gets to a point you can't, then you can't. But submit or quit, stop complaining. Stop complaining. For God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. I know it's not fair, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the right thing. But... The boss, I did all the work, and the boss got all the credit. It was me who did it. Just be quiet. Do it unto the Lord. God will raise you up in the right time. You want to know a great story about this? Read the story of Joseph in Genesis. There's an example of doing your very best even when you're in prison. Doing it unto the Lord. Doing it unto the Lord. The Lord is with Joseph. The Lord's with Joseph. Just say, God is with me. I'm going to do my best. You know how rare it is for somebody to work hard and not complain? I'm telling you right now, you want to rise in your workplace? Come early, stay late, don't complain, and you'll become the CEO of the company. In this culture today, in this entitlement culture, everyone, I need this, I need, oh, you're going to have to pay me more. Please, do your best. Do your best. Work is a privilege, not a right. Every job I ever had, I, always, I, I volunteered at a church. I, I, I did phone calls. I, I took at the pastor's laundry. I did everything for him. He said, you know, I went to the youth retreat. I led worship. He said, we should just hire you. So he hired me. I, I didn't think I owed, no one owed me anything. I'm going to do my work unto the Lord. We got to stop this entire, I have a degree. So what? Work hard. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Okay. For God's pleased when con conscious of his will, you patiently endure Harsh treatment. Okay. <laughs> and First Peter says 2.20, of course you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. Now, I'm not saying you're being beaten, but you get fired or you lose, you get written up. All right? If you're being beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Oh, I'm being persecuted at work. What's happening? Well, I heard one person say this. I am keep sharing my faith, and, and I'm being persecuted. You're not, you're not called. You're not paid to share your faith. You're paid to do the taxes. You're an accountant, not an evangelist. Do the work. You can talk to them after on your private area. Private area. Private time. <laughs> Lord, God, help me. <laughs> Oh, Lord. That too, by the way. Okay, let's go on. Oh, my. oh Lord. Your boss's behavior is not the standard of submission. Submit or quit. Make submitting to your difficult boss an act of worship. I'm going to do it on to God. Even if you have a bad teacher in high school or junior high, I can't stand my teacher. Well, you getting an F doesn't hurt the teacher. It hurts you. Now, don't ask me why I know that. Okay, let's move on. Being mistreated does not give you the right not to submit. Do your best. If you have to go to human resources, you're not supposed to call it that anymore. It's called personnel. Then go ahead and do that. But do your best first. You know, you want a good test to know how you're doing? Here's a test. Here it is. Do you complain about your boss in working conditions to your coworkers or others? Do you? I can't stand this place. It's so irritating. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's terrible here. I can't stand it. You know, 
always put things on me last minute. If you're complaining about the boss, if you're toxic, don't complain. Just work hard. If you got an issue, go to the boss. Don't talk about people behind their backs. It's, that's a wimp. Seriously, you're, being, you're not being a woman. You're being a girl. You're not being a man. You're being a boy. It's time to man up and woman up and, and you know, work. Stop complaining. This is horrible. This is not a place we're, place we're supposed to live. In Luke um, 6, 32 to 33, look what Jesus talks about this, in the context of it at least, okay? It doesn't deal with working conditions, but it deals with something else. He says this. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? It's easy to love people that are nice to you, right? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why shouldn't you get the credit? Even sinners do that much. So big deal. The boss is nice. You treat him nice. So if your coworkers are, are going against the boss and you're acting just like they are and they're not believers, guess what? You're immature. You know what? It's difficult when that's difficult. You want to write that one down. It's difficult when it's difficult. You got to work hard. This is when the rubber hits the road. This is when Christianity really works, okay? For God has called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow his steps. Let me tell you in closing a story that happened to me. I, I finished my Master of Divinity program. I graduated. It was a really cool story how I got this job. I got a job at a mega church in the middle, in, in the mid, Midwest. It was the most prominent, probably the top three churches in the United States of prominence. There was over 6,000 people at the time. This was back in 97. The pastor was on ABC News, NBC News. He had book contracts and all that. He was a big deal. I became his research assistant. So, for example, if he's going to preach on this, I would look up things on slavery. I'd look up the Greek and the Hebrew for him. I'd give him a, kind of a sample outline. I'd try to help him out and this and that. I'd, run, I'd do his laundry for him, pick up his dry cleaning, take his kid to school, pick him up a milkshake, bring his contact lenses in when he forgot to bring them, bring his phone to him when he forgot to bring his phone, all that, did all that. And what happened was on one Sunday evening, he said he needed an outline, so I made him a quick outline. He liked it, preached it well. And then the following night, Following week, on the Saturday evening, we had two services on Sunday morning. 6,000 people, big place. He calls me at 9 o'clock p.m. on a Saturday night and says, hey, hey, Eric, I need you to do something for me. What? I need you to write me a sermon about prayer walking. Uh, excuse me? It's 9 o'clock on a Saturday. Yeah, I need it for tomorrow morning. I'm getting a massage tonight. I'm thinking, okay. It's Saturday night. We're, in a sm we're not in a very big city. You're going to get a, ma a massage at 9 p.m.? Who does massages at 9 p.m.? That's legitimate. Okay? So that night, I was frantic. I mean, my, my heart was out of my chest. I have to write a sermon for 6,000 people, and I have no time. It's 9 o'clock at night. I'm exhausted. So I'm freaking out all night. I mean, I got, I got, I'm cold sweating. I, I'm, I'm anxious. I bring it to him the following morning with no sleep. I give it to him an hour before the service begins. He looks at me. I can't preach this. Get out of my face. You disgust me. He tells me that. He goes over there and preaches. Oh, bless God and all that and all that and all the things. And he, he turned on me. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And I try to make it right with him and all that. And then I realize, you know what? Maybe it's time to go. But, you know, all the while, he would tell like these sexual jokes that were off the, off the hook. I mean, we'd be in the staff meeting or the guys would be, and he'd tell jokes. I didn't even know what he was saying. I didn't even hear that stuff in the locker room in the high schools. It was bad. He would tell jokes all the time, all sexual jokes, and like all these like same sex jokes and all this kind of weird stuff. And I'm like, well, maybe I'm a disapproved guy. I need to lighten up. I'm too religious, or whatever. But I, it wasn't working out. I said, you know what? This is not working out. My dad could use something. Let me go and work with my dad. So I worked with my dad. Flew back home, and uh, I met my wife, Sandra. I mean, that's worth it right there. I got three beautiful children, and I'm talking to you today. But guess what happened to that pastor? Ten years later, he was a national story. He visited a, a male prostitute who was taking crystal meth. Yeah. And... 
you know, and I had to forgive him before that happened. Now, I have to be honest with you. You think, yeah, he knew it. <laughs> yeah, he got his. I honestly didn't feel that way. I felt saddened by it. Why am I telling you this story? Because I'm alive a little longer than I used to be. And I've seen cause and effect. And I didn't know what was going on at the time. But I kept my integrity. I followed the Lord. The Lord took care of me. The Lord took care of him. And I'm here today. Submit to authority. I didn't badmouth him to anybody. Did I want to? You bet. Did I? No. But you're doing it right now. I know. <laughs> it's true. Actually. No, it's 15 years after the fact, goes. It's 15 years after the fact. I didn't mention his name. I'm just telling you guys, do the right thing. God will lead and guide you. God will reward you for doing the right thing. Don't give up. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Okay, look at Jesus. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example. And you must follow it in his steps. He never sinned nor deceived anybody. You never have a right to do the wrong thing because someone's being wrong. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of who? God. Who always judges fairly. Now, was it fair what happened? Listen, it happened. I kept my integrity. It took 10 years, but it happened. Your boss's behavior is not the standard of submission. Submit or quit. Make submitting to your difficult boss an act of worship. Some of you need to take a screenshot and do this tomorrow morning when you go to work. Being mistreated does not give you the right to not submit. God comes to the aid of those who refuse to take matters into their own hands. Listen, everybody, we're supposed to be different. You want to change the world, change your heart. That's where it begins. Remember, we do our work unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much, God. I want to thank you for being faithful to me. I want to thank you, Father God, for being faithful to all these people here today. Lord, we want to be different. We don't want to be like the world, act like the world, think like the world, and, and live in a toxic type of culture. Father, we thank you that we've been called to be different. We've been called to be a blessing. We've been called to do our work unto you. Father, I pray that you would raise us up, that you would raise up every person here, raise them up in the school, raise them up in their office, raise them up in the police stations, raise them up in the executive places. Father, raise them up as they, their standards are high. Lord, we thank you. You've called us to be a blessing and to worship you with our work and that you will reward us even if we don't see it at this side of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, I wanted to do one more thing before we conclude today, and it's this. I always ask this question because we've had people pass away between Sundays, getting in car accidents, drowning. You don't know when your last day is. Are you right with God? Not if you're right with the church. Are you right with God? Remember what I told you. It's not being the right person. It's not acting right. It's about surrendering right. It's about saying this life's not my life. It's God's life. It's not about me. It's about God. God's not waiting for you to get your act together. He's waiting for you to get your surrender together. You'll never get your act together. Never. And that's good news. But you can get your surrender together. And say, God, I give you my life. You're my creator. You're the one that made me. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day. Maybe you used to walk with God and you walked away. If you'd like to give your life to Christ for the very first time, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer in your heart. You repeat after me in your heart. Lord Jesus, that's right, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe not only did you die on the cross, but you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I declare this life is not mine. It's yours. Take it. Fill me now, I pray, with your presence. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you prayed that prayer, we believe you got born again. But Jesus doesn't tell us to say a prayer and that's it. He says, come and follow me. And what I am is a follower of Christ. And what we're trying to do here is lead you to the Christ as a community of believers. So as, we're, as we end our time here today, we have some people up front. Go tell somebody. There's a front desk. You can get, we'll give you a Bible. We want to help you with the next steps. We're all on a journey together. We're a family becoming what God's called us to become. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, just two other things real quick. We have growth track uh, at uh, 1 o'clock today. I'll be teaching it. Love to have you guys come. What does it mean to be a leader? I would love to meet you. I haven't, meet you. I haven't met you yet. That's going on, okay? And there's four different ways to give. Oh, by the way, before we do that, can you put the um, people give the life of Christ number up there? If you give your life to Christ for the first time or prayed that prayer, you want to just text this number. That would be phenomenal. To follow Jesus, get your phone out. 2 4888 And then what you do is you write that. You write belief. Also, in the front pockets uh, of your seat, you can pull it out. You can fill it out and say, I made a decision today. Listen, guys, if you, if you do this, this will help you. You need to tell somebody, all right? Also, we have four different ways you can give. You don't have to give. You get to give. It's God's anyhow. I've seen it happen. I trust God. I, I tithe. I give. I've never seen God fail us as a family. He's always met our needs, not our greeds. Test the Lord in this, and he'll do it. And so, Father, bless this offering today in Jesus' name. May you utilize it, Father, to grow us, to grow our families, to grow our communities, to touch our missionaries around the world as we spread out to all the continents of the earth. We thank you for this time today, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So those are the four different ways. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire, 77977, cornerstonecheshire.com. You can mail it. Also, as you walk out of here today, there are boxes everywhere. It says, uh, tithe and offering box. Put the card in there. If you filled it out and your offering, we'd appreciate it. Well, I want to conclude what I've been doing lately is I've just been giving a benediction or blessing. So may the Lord bless you. May he fill you with his peace, his love, his acceptance. May the Holy Spirit fill you and give you the ability and the power to walk out what he's done for you. And may you experience the acceptance and the love of the Father who loves you with all love and all power. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. God bless you guys. Thank you.